Hello and welcome to episode 65 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. For those of you who are listening for the first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm CEO and co-founder of Synergen Group. I'm passionate about all things leadership and management, so passionate in fact that I decided to start a podcast about it. And here we are in season two and my purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. In today's show, I speak with Sandra Alloy, who is the founder and CEO of the Bureau of Business, which is a boutique, full-service, PR, marketing, events, and lifestyle agency. They traditionally service industry sectors such as food, fashion, retail, property, and lifestyle brands. They look to breathe new life into these brands and help them create, refresh, or reposition them, developing authentic brand stories and memorable visual languages to bring out their best. Sandra is a highly experienced professional with almost 20 years experience in protecting and enhancing the reputation of multinational organisations servicing markets in Australia, New Zealand, Asia Pacific and North America. She's worked for organisations such as Fairfax, BASF, Dow Chemicals and also the EPA. And as well as being the CEO of the Bureau of Business, she's recently launched a new venture, The Mind of Fem a new initiative that is committed to increasing the visibility of women in Australia and abroad who are capturing our attention through their determination to drive change in the world as we know it. Now, during the course of the conversation, we explore a number of different ideas. We start by looking back at Sandra's leadership journey, beginning when she was first in charge of a team of three. We also explore what the idea of diversity of thinking is, and if a leader is going to get the most out of their team, how they can apply it. Kidnappingness is another topic we discuss from a number of perspectives about how and why it happens. And we end up exploring the idea of how we can become the best versions of ourselves by believing in ourselves as leaders and people. So keep listening. And as always, we'd really like to hear your thoughts about the interview with Sandra Alloy, CEO of the Bureau of Business. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Sandra, to the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really happy that you've taken the time to be a part of it. Pleasure. So that the listeners have a bit of an idea about uh, who you are and what you do, who is Sandra Alloy? Well, Sandra Alloy is the founder and director of the Bureau of Business. We are a lifestyle PR communications events and marketing agency. Um, We predominantly work with food, fashion and lifestyle brands. And what makes us so unique is the fact that um, we bring brands to life and by repositioning and making them more sociably acceptable into the marketplace. Okay. And so when you say bring brand, brands to life, that's a that's an interesting phrase. Yeah. What, what does that sort of mean? Well, it's a reflection on the, our methodology, which makes us so unique. And what makes us so unique is the fact that um, we unlock the purpose behind brands. And brands aren't these days all about colour and movement. It's all about the why, the why brands exist. So our methodology goes into a deep dive environment where we speak to members behind the brand to uncover and discover um, the why behind these brands and once we've found that why or once we find that why we're able to create strategies to make these brands more uh, sociable and more personable so people can emotionally connect with them because there is a saying out there that says people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it so based on that analogy it's really enhancing the way we work with brands and bring them to life So is there an interesting fact you can share with us about uh, the Bureau of Business that the listeners might not know? Well, the Bureau of Business, one of the facts is that it's based around my experience in working with media and lifestyle brands for the past 20 odd years. And yes, I've worked with a lot lot of these brands in Australia, the US, Asia Pacific and parts um, parts of New Zealand. And a lot of the time, it was always about creating an emotional connectedness with the audience or the reader or the listener. 
and I felt I was able to empower brands by doing that. So I've taken that methodology and brought it across to the to the bureau, and as a consequence, here we are bringing brands to life okay. every day. So I'd like to take you back. Yes. All the way back to your first significant leadership role. Mm -hmm. Are you able to share with the listeners a little about what that was and give it some context? Oh, when I was working in the media, I was looking after a team of three people. And this was when I was very early on in in, uh, my my media days and very new to management I didn't really understand the difference between leadership and management so I was partially in my opinion a manager managing the day-to-day tasks but also a leader by default uh, because I have this innate ability to become very passionate about what I do and as a consequence of that I bring people on board and enable them and empower them to also follow the direction I'm going as well. So um, I was able to create new initiatives um, purely by guesswork. I really didn't know what I was doing, but we um, we had a very good, solid, cohesive team um, and we, we managed to tick the boxes, we managed to, to make targets. We managed to empower other members of my team who then went off to other parts of the organisation to lead other areas. And um, and I found that it was very empowering for me because I really didn't know what I was doing, but I learned a lot um, because of the feedback. And um, yeah, that was one of the things that I thought, I really like this. I like the feeling of empowerment. I love the feeling of um, enabling other people to follow my vision and it wasn't just about me it was about us and the terminology in the spoken language changed from I to us and as I said I didn't really know um, what I was doing but it was kind of an innate thing and I've I've just simply um, since then throughout my entire career kept um, using books and talking to people having mentors and a whole range of people to really uh, strengthen that part of my professional career to who I am today. Hmm. Really seems to be a common theme when I talk to people that uh, when we have our first leadership role, we don't actually ever no. know what we're doing. We sort of quite often just sort of work our way through it. Yep. Well, a lot of the time there's no real cookie cutter um, process to becoming a leader. There's no right way or wrong way. It's what it's all to do with. Um, I believe it's a learned behaviour. Um, and I think you can you can learn how to become a leader um, and I think it stems from an innate ability and that is to have this vision and unless you have if you don't have that vision it's very difficult in my opinion to become a leader because um, what I now know about leadership and the books that I'm currently reading for example I'm reading um, Michelle Obama's memoir um, oh, and oh, it's called Becoming and it's all about life but her journey throughout life and it's not necessarily about leadership but it's also about her becoming and who would have thought that the person that she is today has become this wonderful amazing inspiring woman as a result of her life journey um, so leaders, in my opinion, have to have life experience, have to have this vision and have to be diverse in their thinking and also have the courage because not always things turn out the way you want it to be. And, uh, and leaders generally have to withstand that, have to be able to work through the adversity. Um, if it was an easy job, everyone would do it, but you have to be a particular person to become a leader. You mentioned before that you enjoyed the sense of empowerment in your first role. Are you able to, when you reflect back, say that was the role where you decided the whole leadership thing was for you? Yes, because I'm a bit of a high achiever myself. Um, I come from a culture where you had to always get good marks. This was before social media, so I'm probably showing my age. Um, But it was always about study, study hard, get great grades and if you could get good grades were well, then you can do whatever you wanted to do and yes I had enough 
um, to get into medicine and or law, but I chose to get into the science arena and I did psychology and marketing and I then did, did a secondary teacher's degree. Um, but yes, uh, what I felt was even when I was a student, um, I've always had this inner strength to, to do well, succeed, become an overachiever because then the world is yours. And what I know now is if I empower others, it's not about me any, anymore. I'm now wanting to prove to others that they can do it as well, that if I can do it, anybody can. And I, there's nothing better for me to give someone the ability to become better than what they think they can do. Um, and I want to be able to show others that there's a lot more out there if they try. And they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to have squillions of dollars in their bank account. They don't have to be um, the smartest person in the room. They just have to have passion and believe in themselves. Mm. And I love that. So you've had your first taste of leadership. Mm -hmm. what, what move did you make and why? The move in, in terms of my career? Mm. Um, I moved because I wanted more. I got to the point in my career that I couldn't do any more and I was con concerned that I was going to plateau and I'm always wanting to learn and I guess that's a quest that I have in life that every day even with my business with the bureau every day is a different day and I was in fact talking to a client this morning that um, he said to me, I'm going back to the office to do the mundane. And, I'm, and I kind of feel sorry for him because he knows that every day has got its um, activities. Like in the morning, he has to do this. And in the afternoon, he knows how to plan his day. With me, I plan my day by, by the minute. Um, in PR, anything can happen at any given time and any given day. So... Um, and I'm used to working like that. And that goes back into my media days that with media, um, anything can happen, especially today with social media, everything is so live and everything is is happening in the, in the present moment. So um, I want to be able to do things um, in a way where I can continuously learn and gives me the opportunity to do diverse things while at the same time um, empower others to do the same. I would never have thought 10, 15, 20 years ago that I'd be in the position that I am now. Yeah. So can you share a little bit more detail about your business? Yeah. Well, we are a PR, communications, marketing and events agency. We work with food, fashion and lifestyle brands. And as I mentioned before, what makes it so unique is this methodology and that's what I love to do because without it it's very difficult for us to do a strategy per se so in that we get the clients in the room and there's a particular process that we uh, that we go through and a lot of the people in the room do a self-discovery as well and again it's that that thrill for me that I make people think differently about their brand um, and that's, that for me means a lot. And then from that, we are able to put strategies together. And, um, and as I said, it's food, fashion and lifestyle. So we work with a diverse range of brands, um, Australian and overseas brands. Um, and we're in, also in the process of launching a unique platform that aims, aims to increase the visibility of women in Australia and abroad. And we're touching on themes that women care about. So anything to do with social issues, inclusion, diversity. And we're packaging those particular areas up into podcasts. We're packaging them up into conversations and really getting to the nuts and bolts of what really matters to women today. Um, and how to embrace it and how to make it so it's not taboo and not for women to be afraid to discuss and openly discuss. So it's a, um, a safe platform for women to, um, to bring those particular issues to the fort. Um, I would hope that um, in the next 
12 months that we become a leading platform for these kinds of themes and uh, where women can come to, turn to um, and share their thoughts and, and ideas about. So is that platform an extension of your business? How, how does the relationship yeah, work Yeah, it's, it's an extension because it comes again, it goes back to the person that I am. I'm always continuously learning and wanting to create new things. Um, I've always been um, an avid thinker and I've always been an advocate for women um, and, and what women can do throughout my career. Um, it's always been, well I've experienced it as a struggle um, and it's only been the past few years that I thought what I thought was a struggle, I thought it was the norm. And I just thought, well, that's just the way it is. Well, uh, up until a couple of years ago, I thought, well, then I, I've been, I'm wrong. This is not the case. This is not the way it should be. We need to have a culture where we can explore, create, and, um, and, and share these ideas to not take over the world, but it's more to do with create more diversity in our thinking um, and more inclusion. Women need to be heard. Women, women also need to be part of the conversation. And I feel, I feel like we haven't been. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm showing my age because um, I just thought it was the norm that women kind of were always a step away from the conversations that were had. Um, and we always missed the opportunity. Now it's the time when we now have a voice and I want to make the, the, the mind of femme the voice where women can make a difference. Okay. I'm curious about what you, when you talk about uh, diversity. Yeah. And the reason, one of the reasons I'm sort of recently curious is I was listening to an interview the other day on the radio and uh, the the woman on the, the show was promoting a mentoring program for women mm-hmm. and in the music industry. Oh wow! Yeah, and the and the and the host was uh, asking some questions, and but what I found a little frustrating was that the guest would say diversity is a good thing, but then wouldn't follow it up oh. with anything, right? And, and sort of was, was sort of all these motherhood statements, and I thought the interviewer left it a little a little light on because I'm a big believer in diversity of thinking, diversity across the board. So mm-hmm. why is diversity such a such an important thing? I think it's an important trait. Um, it can be brought into any conversation. And if we talk about and skew it towards leadership, um, diversity is an important part of a leader because your team makeup is made up of all these different cultures, backgrounds, life experiences, a whole range of thinking education, social backgrounds, a whole range of things. So to get people on board in that leadership sense, um, you have to embrace different thinking. And and I'm going to be a little bit um, kind of cheesy right now, but there's no I in team, right? So that in the leadership means, uh, leadership sense means that to get people to follow your vision, you have to not have the, you have to have the vision, but you don't have to have the, all the answers. So your team can help you embrace what you need to get there. Um, and often, when you get successful people, when you talk to them, they've got successful teams around them because they generally don't know the ins and outs of everything. They don't know the ins and outs of the financial markets. They don't know the ins and outs of all the different industries. You need diversity of thinking to get your vision and bring it to life. So um, apart from that, I think in the leadership sense, it's an important trait. In, um, in PR, it's also an important trait where the way you convey your message, you have to be diverse and not be offensive. Um, and you have to be considerate of who your market is, who your audience is. Um, and so, again, when I was studying um, in university, diversity, I don't think I ever heard diversity. Um, so it was kind of an unknown. And what I simply have learned that diversity comes in all traits, 
all cultures. And in music, I would simply be, well, the fact that you've got different genres um, and you can, you can, you can listen to, like at the moment, I'm listening to a whole range of, of um, music. I'm listening to Triple J's and Nova, and at times I listen to Triple M. That's diverse. You're listening from rock to, to, to contemporary through to a pop. It's diverse thinking. It depends on mood and it depends on how I'm feeling. And music for me is very inspiring. I've always... This is going to sound strange, but even when I was studying for exams, I've always had to have music in the background. Not because, apart from the fact that I like listening to it, but it was almost like an automatic blocker. Uh, with music, I was able to block all the music around me and all the sounds around me and focus on what I was doing. So for me, um, music is an important part. But to be diverse, uh, to, to um, include diversity um, in music that's what makes us so unique and there's nothing better than just listening to different types of music. Mm. It's beautiful. So I'm going to ask you about your area of leadership passion. Mm. So you're in business, you're running your, your, your own business, which is a, a challenge in itself, yep. as I well know. Where's your passion? My passion's in people and... Um, even from my career, a lot of the brands that I've worked for across the world has always been about, as I mentioned before, it, it's about creating an emotional connectedness with your brand and with the audience. Um, so my, my passion belongs in creating that connect, a connection with the audience and with the market. Um, but fundamentally, it's all about people. Um, the people that create um, this connectedness and sometimes I stand back and I just think at the end of the campaign or the project and I think wow did we really do this it's kind of um, amazing to think that with our collective team that we created such an amazing masterpiece or um, something that seemed to be a challenge we overcame by a whole range of diverse thinking um, leadership uh, creativity, but I can assure you I couldn't have done it by myself. Um, I would have struggled to achieve that, but we did it as a consequence of the team. And um, that's what gives me immense satisfaction. It's having the, uh, the people in the room to create and to create something that was considered a challenge into something that becomes so relatable out there into the, the real world. So how do you go about building this connectedness? Because it's not an easy thing to do. No, it, it goes back to our methodology and that's what makes us so unique. And um, once you go through that methodology, it's, it's an easy process. It's a two-part methodology. Um, it's more exploratory, uh, exploratory where we look at um, the journey with the consumer and the brand and the brand and the consumer and um, the perception out there and a whole range of factors that come into it, but also understanding um, the why. Um, once we speak to the client and the why, um, we are able to really understand where they're coming from and create another level of connectedness with, with the audience. Something that um, I don't think that um, I've experienced before. Um, with other agencies um, and what we do is something that's quite unique to us and a lot of our clients uh, walk away with um, great satisfaction and pleasure by doing that exercise because they themselves do it um, after so many years of doing it the same way all the time every time we make them think differently um, and that's that to me is um, quite fulfilling and uh, yeah, I love working with brands on, on working through that process. So with your, with your campaigns and your brands, are you sort of doing short term? Are you engaged on a year long campaign? How, do, how does it sort of work? They range. Um, a lot of our clients are 12 months okay. um, and some have been, 
or so far we've only been um, as an agency for two and a half years so we've the longest client we've got is a year and a half and they started with us from when we are when we started um, and we've got some new ones so we're just doing um, activations at the moment for the uh, the next few months so they're only going to be three month periods but again we still have to do that exploratory component um, and everything has to evolve around that because otherwise if you have um, the why it disconnected with what they're trying to achieve there's a disconnect with the audience there's a lot of confusion out there um, so for example um, Apple is often widely used in this example Apple make amazing technology mm -hmm. and um, but at the end of the day if you boil down to it, they make computers and software, but they make it in the why is for them, in my opinion, is making it so unique that you and I can embrace that technology in our everyday life, mm -hmm. in on our phones, on our laptops, on our desks, um, and every which way that Apple interfaces in our life, that's their why. They want to create and be part of our the way we live. Um, but if you boil down to it, the what is computer? The what is the computer and the technology that sits in the computer? But that, their why is so unique. So that's why they're able to do these funky campaigns because they want to relate to us. They want to relate to our lifestyle. They want to relate to the fact that when, when they're targeting the business person, that they can still have their business conversation on walking down the street as opposed to when I was going to university you had to have a phone that was linked to a cord that was linked to a phone connected to a wall so you only could have that phone call even um, in an office environment or at home or in a phone box <laughs> there wasn't much choice yeah. speaking about Apple because I just got my new iPhone yesterday what because it's I, I see it that you know if talking phones, Samsung users are, are adamant that Samsung's are a much better phone than Apple. But to me, it gets back to what you're saying about this connectedness. Are there key key sort of points you you've been able to discover about why I'm connected to Apple, for example? Is there is there key things that they do that I'm not aware of? Is there... Well, you can't have a brand that appeals to everybody. Okay, so with Apple, for example. They're wanting to communicate a particular message to a particular person. So, for example, there's a division of the market where, say, I'm, I'm just making up numbers, 10% of the market are the ones that are the early adopt adopters. They're the ones that would line up outside an Apple store to get the phone. Um, and or you go to you know, the AFL Grand Final, for example. They're the ones that would sleep out. Apart from being footy fans and gurus of the game, it means a lot for them to do that. So with the Apple, for example, Apple example, it means a lot for them to have the latest and greatest phones because then they can feel like they're a part of that brand. They're connected to that brand. The same with the AFL Grand Final. Those avid supporters that want to see their incredible team play at the Grand Final, they want to say that they were there and it means a lot for them to be there. That's the 10%. Then you have a, a, maybe a, a larger percentage of the marketplace that would simply say, right, I'm going to get one anyway, but I don't have to sleep there overnight, but I'll get there maybe a week later. Um, but they'll get the phone. Then you get the majority um, of that marketplace that simply says, oh, well, wait until that middle section group once they get their phone after a week on how they think about that phone then if they say it's okay then i'll buy it so that's the majority of the market so if you want to get the majority of that market to buy your phone you have to make sure that that middle group absolutely rave about your phone um, so the majority will actually buy that phone that's how you get market share so that's the thinking and the science behind brands where um, if you want to get market share you have to make sure that middle group rave about your product to the point where it excites the larger component of the marketplace simply say right i've got to get one um, and as a consequence of that they're only targeting a certain group of people so 
even with that larger percentage of the market, they will need to think, okay, what does it mean for me if I buy that phone? If they're saying that it's got a phone, it's got music, it's got this and it can do that, well, that fits my lifestyle. But if you don't need that, you're not going to be interested in buying it because the, then at the other end of the scale, you've got a small percentage of the market that don't care less. They're probably walking around with the Motorola, the, the brick <laughs> style Motorola. They don't care. As long as it makes a phone call, that's all they care about. So, But if you want to get market share, you have to get the majority of people to simply say, it's absolutely the ant's pants, you've got to get it. Um, but then again, that there's also a slither of the market that don't care less mm. because that's just who they are. And is that part of part of what you do with your in your work? Is you you try to work with the brands to get that sort of that market share and that core group? Yeah, it's important for us to get that middle group I was mentioning before to make these brands more sociable. So, um, the future of PR it looks like that it's going towards the digital side. Okay, so the content has to be socially. Um, presentable and it also needs to engage the audience not only through words but visually as well Um, so in terms of getting the middle group on board um, you want to make sure that when they say this phone and they're raving about it and they're saying this phone is the best you want to make sure you get the influencers on board and talk to um, the rest of the majority of the group to simply say you've got to get one of these phones because it's absolutely brilliant. So that's the purpose of um, the influencer market because they help that that middle group to simply say, I'm influencing behaviour here to get the majority of the marketplace to simply say, get one of these. Um, And again, as I said, you get a slither of the market, they don't care less. Um, Yes, it looks great, but they move on. so that's why you've got influencers involved and ambassadors because these people influence our behaviour. Um, so, and it means a lot for the people, the early adopters, that if these influencers are, are using the latest phone, are wearing the latest and greatest, are driving the best, then they're probably influenced to buy. With the, with, with the clients you're working with, are you seeing... The leaders at those organisations are really starting to latch onto the idea that they their brand needs to be connected, that they need to try to be influencers, that they you know everything needs to be sociable. Are they are they making that connection? Marketing and PR um, is often considered, in some cases, an afterthought. Um, It should be part of the business strategy um, and should be part of the growth process. It's often considered, in some cases, it's often considered as, okay, um, we've got, we've made so much turnover this year, we'll just spend, you know, a small amount on, on marketing and hoping for the best without really aiming for a strategic outcome apart from, um, a dream and, and to get sales and things, um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of education that needs to be had, and I think slowly now people are now a lot of these brands are turning around and thinking there is a value in driving this influence and in driving this change um, of thinking because if you don't continuously innovate and don't continuously connect with your audience, you're going to lose market share. Um, the market, particularly with social media, is evolving. Consumer behaviour is changing, so it is forcing brands to think differently. But as I said, it's ships don't turn around very quickly, so it'll it'll be a slow move. Um, But they are slowly thinking, well, how do we create um, traction out there into the marketplace? How do we get our message heard? Um, But that takes time, and once people see results, then they start investing in in strategies that connect with audiences. So what does uh, I would like to explore what the future looks like? Well, the future, as I mentioned, it's, it's going very digital and social. Um, I, I really believe, and there's probably people out there saying, oh, I don't know about that. Um, my view is there's no such thing anymore for a media release. There won't be a place for media releases anymore. Um, And 
the content that you and I will read will be very socially driven. Um, just think about the way you and I research things before we buy anything, whether it be a car, whether it be a home, whether it be a chair or new furniture or whatever. We always go online, go to Google. Thank God for Google. Um, we go on there to see you know, if there's a review or you want to see what options there are in grey chairs or pink chairs or yellow chairs and price points, you want to check that because A, it saves time, it's convenient. Then you want to find out, you know, how you can buy things. So you want to read, research, learn on, on Google. So the question you asked me was about the future of PR. It's going to play a big role on social um, and in digital media, um, the way we interact and engage with, with, with media and, and news content. Um, it's going to be not only content driven, but also visual. Um, there'll be a lot of shorter spurts. Um, but I think it's going to be a combination of, I mean, print will always play a role, um, but there'll be a combination of different new sources. For example, if there's a major event happening somewhere in the world, we'll be able to jump online, re read a newspaper first, and you'll have links to go online to see some visual footage of that actual disaster or event. Um, then you might sort of be directed to a podcast to talk about some experts interpretation of what's just happened. Um, so there'll be a whole range of different sources that will amplify the message and give audiences a lot more information um, about what's just taken place. Back in my day, it was just print. And growing up in Adelaide, we had two newspapers, one in the morning, the morning edition, and the afternoon edition. And these were Murdoch papers. So the four o'clock edition was kind of the current. You always run to the milk bar. To, to, we didn't have 7-Eleven in Adelaide, so it was always the milk bar. So we always used to run and get the four o'clock newspaper to see what was current. This was pre-social media. Internet was kind of slowly coming in, but people were thinking, what is this? So they didn't really go into Google. Um, but they just relied on their newspaper. Today we have a myriad of different ways to get information. You can tweet, you can become part of the conversation, you can share visuals if you happen to be near an event or near an incident. Even with 3AW, uh, for example, you can ring in and, and talk about um, an accident on the road and it's warning other drivers to avoid that area. So there's different ways in which we engage information and that to me is very exciting. Um, we can get a 360 view of what is happening around the world as opposed to just um, what I used to grow up with and that was this newspaper. Um, and I'm not simply saying uh, newspapers are boring, there, there's certainly a value with newspapers but there's um, different ways in which we can um, get information these days. Mm. So what does the future hold for you in your business? So within that broader environment what does it hold for you and your business well we're very much content driven um, and part of this connectedness that I mentioned before it's about creating content um, and content marketing that can't that's kind of a bit of a, a trendy word at the moment um, so I'm excited to find out where that's going and continue continue to drive this content um, in these marketing messages so I want to grow the business and using the mind of FEM as a way to use content but create it in new, uh, different platforms that people to uh, my audience can integrate with, share with um, and become part of. Because another thing I didn't mention about content is apart from being visual and short spurts, it needs to also be shareable as well so that's the future so if I saw something today and perhaps you didn't I'll be simply say oh I'm going to email you this story because it's fabulous um, you've got to read it so um, once upon a time you used to cut out clippings in newspapers and hand them over and post it to people now it's so easy with email and, and websites 
So with the Mind of Femme, if you happen to miss a conversation, you can go to one of our podcasts um, where you can uh, listen to an inspiring woman about her story and, and see how we can take some key learnings from that story to empower others to, to go about it differently or to, to feel empowered about themselves as individuals. And so when, when's your Mind of Femme launching? Well, the Mind of Femme is launching in June this year okay. and the podcast will kick off around September for the spring. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So are there any last sort of words on leadership you'd like to share with the listeners? Um, leadership is something that we need a lot more of in our corporate environment, uh, particularly when it comes to diversity. Um, and as I said before, it's not just in gender, it's, it's about diversity of thinking. And I think you mentioned it before with your radio program, um, and it's, sorry, the mu- music program. Um, I think we need a lot more diversity and it's not about gender, it's about different ways of looking at things um, and to explore different issues differently but empower others to do the same. I think there's, um, there's good leaders out there and um, I think people should always have mentors where they can become better people, not to all become leaders, but to become better individuals and make their mark on the world in, in, in their own way. So whether it be better at what they do as a professional or as a mum or a school teacher or whoever it is, to become continuously search to become better. Um, and who knows, in, in five years down the track that you know they've become this person that they thought would never have dreamt of. Um, for example, with Michelle Obama, I'm still reading through her her memoir, coming from south parts of Chicago to becoming the first lady. Um, wow, it's it's a simply wow moment um, as a reader, but you know her life journey has taken her in that direction and I, th- I think stories like that are inspiring and um, if we can learn from people like that to empower us that just because we're born in the south parts of Chicago or when the odds are against us with life or whatever the case might be that we can't become the person we want to become you just have to have faith in yourself and leaders have that vision leaders have that passion um, and I just think it would be a better place if we always believed in ourselves as opposed to just thinking that, no, this is it for me. Mm. And I think a lot of people would actually uh, like Michelle Obama to run for president. I'd actually. like that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so if people want to find out more about you and the work that you do, where should they go? I'd love them to go to the Bureau of Business website. Sure. which is bureauofbusiness.com.au or if they want to find out more about the Mind of Femme, they can go to mindoffem.com.au. Fantastic. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Sandra, for being part of the podcast. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Well, that wraps up episode 65 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast, another great leader interview episode. I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the, our website, Synergen Group, and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode, tell us who you'd like us to interview, and tell us what sort of content you'd like us to deliver. And if you are an iPhone user, please feel free to head on over to the Apple site and leave us a review. It would really help us in expanding the reach of the podcast. In next week's episode, I introduce another curriculum ecosystem episode where we explore emotional intelligence from the perspective of understanding others. So it's another great content episode. Until then, love to hear what you think and happy listening.